evening, everybody. Good to see you on here tonight. I'm Pastor Rick here at New Life Christian Assembly in Haverhill, Mass. And uh, we'll be here for the next hour or so, uh, sharing the Word on Wednesday night in the Word from the uh, New Life Christian Assembly of God office at uh, 966 Main Street, Haverhill, Mass. Uh, how's everybody doing? I wanted to start off tonight by reading a scripture. And I just want to read this really quickly as we get started here. Psalm 133. Some of you know it. Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is the precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edges of his garments. It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing life forevermore and uh, how good and pleasant it is to have fellowship with you tonight uh, we greet you in jesus name uh, let me just take a minute to say hello to those that are here if you would please hit your share button i'm going to go for 30 people tonight i i don't know if you all could see but on my screen i could see how many people are on here and there's 17 right now which is wonderful but I think if everyone hit your hit your share button, uh, we may pick up a few people from you know your friends or your people that kind of are are floating around Facebook, stumbling upon something. Wouldn't it be good if they stumbled upon the Word of God and and the Holy Spirit used that to touch their heart in a special way? So anyway, eighteen, that's good. So uh, okay, so from the beginning, Sandy Whitney, God bless you, my brother Anthony Casina, down in New Jersey, God bless you, my friend. Uh, Lorinda, good to have you back here. Lorinda, you're back in Haverhill. You and uh, your friend Sandy, of course, is with you. God bless you. Hope you're doing well. Uh, Jean Eaton, Jean, let us know how your brother's doing. Uh, give us a little update, unless you did already. I didn't get that far yet. Uh, Lisa Conway, good to see you, Lisa. Dolores, Dolores, you continue to be a blessing with those beautiful flowers every Sunday morning. I don't know if everyone knows that you do that. It's kind of like a behind the scenes thing, but Dolores grows these beautiful flowers in her backyard and every Sunday blesses the, the sanctuary with a, a bouquet of flowers and they're, they're placed right in front of the, uh, of the pulpit. So thank you for that. Angela, good to see you, Angela. Go Red Sox, right? Uh, okay, Sandy, Lisa, Lorinda, pray for my brother. We will do that. I, I was wondering about your brother the other night. He's no longer in his right mind. Oh, and your sister needs help. We will pray for that in just a second. Uh, James Carter, hey, Brother James. Uh, okay, Pauline, God bless you, Pauline. Anita, good to see you on here tonight. Pastor Bill, good to see you. Uh, Brother Jerry Ellis, hope you're doing well, recovering from COVID down in Thompson, Connecticut. Uh, Danica, God bless you, Danica, always good to see you. My lovely wife, wife, Pamela Quinn Amendola. God bless you, Pamela. Uh, okay, 18. Yeah, I see 18 on here now, Sandy. Uh, Jeannie Ellis, praying for you, Jeannie, if you get well. Billy Cobbett, happy birthday to you, Millie. I know it was uh, yesterday, I believe, right? Happy birthday. Hope you're doing well. Hope your granddaughter, Eva, is doing well, too. We've been praying for her. Okay, Dolores, the florist. <laughs> Yeah, go Sox. Phil Colangelo. Hey, my my nephew, Philip Colangelo, down in Virginia Beach. Right, Philip? God bless you. Listen, hit your share button, everybody. Now we got 19. Can we go for 20? Can we go for 20? Uh, hit your share button, and we're going to pray if some more people in here. But hey, you know what? It's all good anyway. Whatever, whoever comes on is good. I just have a personal goal of reaching 30 people at one time here. I think we have 30 people on uh, Sunday nights. Is that right? Or is it 20 people? I forget now. Anyway, well, let's go to the Lord and pray. Uh, let's pray for Lorinda Karn's brother. And, uh, and we're going to pray for the Ellis's. And uh, hey, Alinda, good to see you on here. All right. Newport News, Virginia. All right. Very good, Philip. 29 on Sunday morning. Well, hallelujah for that. I didn't know that, James. I didn't I didn't see the uh that report. But anyway, that's that's great. So let's go for 30. Oh, we're up to 20. Praise the Lord. See that? It's working a little bit. 
So little by little, 21. All right, it's very good. Uh, okay, so we're going to pray for the Ellis's with their COVID situation. We're going to pray for, let's see, Lorinda's request for her brother. Where did that go? Let me find that again. Oh, boy. Okay, got it. Okay, let's go to the Lord right now. Dear Lord God, uh, we read Psalm 133. Lord, how, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. We pray, Lord, for that unity to fall upon the body of Christ tonight in a very special way. <clears throat> Even though we're on live stream, let us sense your presence. Let us sense each other's presence as well. And uh, let it warm our hearts as we fellowship with you, Lord, and, and with one another. We do pray your blessing over our study in the Word tonight as we get into Daniel. We pray, Lord, also for uh, Lorinda, for her brother, uh, for healing of cancer. Uh, he's no longer in his right mind. And we pray for her sister that's caring for him. <clears throat> Lord, what a difficult situation. Touch this family, Lord, in a special way. I believe they're out in California or is it Arizona. I forget right now. But Lord, touch them. Heal her brother. Touch her brother. And uh, touch Lorinda's sister as well. Bring peace and, and hope into their heart and spirit. And be with Lorinda as well at this time. Father, we do want to pray for uh, Bob Arsenault, uh, Linda Squibb's dad, who's very, very sick. Uh, as, this, as the song says, knocking on heaven's door. We pray, Lord, uh, according to the family's desire, Lord, either heal him or take him home peacefully and let your touch be upon him and upon the family in a very special way. So, Lord, we thank you for all this. We pray for our sister Millie on her birthday, Lord. Bless her year this year. Bless her granddaughter. Keep, her in, her, keep Millie in good health. Keep her granddaughter in good health with the kidney problem. And uh, we just give it all to you, Lord, and pray for your touch to be upon them. So, Lord, bless our night tonight. We welcome your Holy Spirit, and we thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. All righty. Okay, Colleen is here. All right. Oh, <laughs> Alinda, uh, our nephew, Philip Colangelo, if you scroll back a little bit, uh, lives in Newport News. So you're, you're not too far away from him, I guess. Uh, Philip is originally from Pittsburgh, but uh, been living in Newport News for a while. Okay, got 20 people on here, which is wonderful. So hit your share button. Let's get a few more people on here if we can. Eva Rogers, God bless you, Eva. Good to see you. All right. Well, I want to make a special announcement. Uh, there's a yard sale this Saturday at the church parking lot from 9.30 to 2. Uh, all the proceeds of those that want to rent a table will go towards our missions fund, which is lacking right now. We need a little help. So Pamela put this together uh, to try to, you know, get some money going for our missions ministry. Uh, so if you want to get involved, if you want a table to sell some of your stuff, it's $25 per table. Uh, you can contact Pamela at 774-289-8129. I sent it out in the email today, so you can check your email as well. Uh, also, I uh, wanted to mention our dear brother, Pastor Bill Spurdione, uh will be officially getting ordained, finally, um, on Sunday evening, October the 24th, uh, at the Southern New England Ministry Network Annual Conference. It's a Sunday night, 6 p.m., at Liberty Church in Shrewsbury. That's about an hour away. Uh, this has been a long time coming. It was postponed because of COVID last year, and maybe the year before there was another hang up or something, but uh, finally uh, they're gonna have the ordination. There's probably uh, several people, numerous people getting ordained from various churches across our district, but uh, Pamela and I will be down there and everyone is welcome to come and cheer our brother and his wife Heidi on as uh, he's officially ordained with the Assemblies of God. Alrighty, um, just want to mention before we get into the word. Uh, oh, I see that Millie. I'll get to that in one second. All right. Um, we, 
I want to take a minute. I want to pray for Millie Cobb's request for her daughter, Sarah, has melanoma cancer. Uh, okay, we'll pray for that. But um, I wanted to mention uh, several churches in town, probably across the whole country, are having a difficult time. Uh, COVID has done a job on, on many churches, as, as you know. Uh, some churches have actually closed down. Um, others are just struggling to, to maintain with uh, their finances, with uh, supporting missions. Like, we're kind of having a hard time supporting missions right now. Uh, good thing we have some extra money in our general fund, but that won't last forever. Um, and uh, let's see. I, I wanted to, to, to pray for the churches that, that people would come to church. And I, I love live stream. I, I do. I appreciate it. Uh, James was telling us we had 29 people on Sunday. I didn't realize that. That's, that's a lot for a Sunday morning. Um, and, and, you know, people are from all over the place, actually. But there's probably a good 10 or 15 that are from the area that, for whatever reason, have chosen to stay home and watch it on live stream. I'm looking forward to the day when, you know, people will come into the church and uh, we get that feeling of like a, a, a community of believers. Um, maybe on Sundays I could check with James about the numbers of those on there. I could make some comment as we go along. But I, I, I miss the days of uh, you know Sunday mornings and the church is packed and people are talking and fellowshipping and spilling their coffee on the rug. Uh, not really, I don't miss that, but... <laughs> I miss those days when there was a lot of excitement in the church. We have a little bit of excitement going on, don't get me wrong. And, and the presence of the Lord is definitely there. But uh, like many churches, we're down probably a, 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 to a half of what we were. And I'm just wanna, I want to encourage people, you know, if you can come to church, come to church. If you have to stay on live stream, stay on live stream. But we would love to have you in church if possible. Uh, so let's take a minute and pray for, for that. And I want to pray for Millie's request as well. All righty. Okay. Father, I want to lift up Millie's daughter, Sarah, that has melanoma. Uh, we pray for healing. Uh, she's having surgery tomorrow. Uh, they're going to take a piece of it out. So, Lord God, just touch, this, touch the doctors, the surgeons, the medical team. Uh, be with Sarah. Give her peace, oh God, right now. Give her peace in her mind, heart, soul, spirit. Uh, let her have a confidence that you'll be with her. Uh, as your word says, I think it's Psalm 121, you, you're the God of Jacob. You'll watch over us, our going in, our going out. And so as she goes into surgery and out of surgery, we pray for your covering to be over her. And uh, let, that, let that melanoma cancer be removed in the name of Jesus. Let her heal quickly and permanently. And let it not be a, a lingering issue for her any, any longer. But Father, we do want to pray for the churches. I want to pray for your church, Lord. Lord, well, I could list some churches by name, but I don't want to do that. I just, I just pray for churches tonight, Lord. We, we lift up the body of Christ. We pray for pastors, for leaders, for teachers, for uh, advisory committees and, and board members to be encouraged in these, in these days that have changed so radically uh, from how they were uh, now a year, year and a half ago before COVID hit. Father, we pray that um, uh, people would come to church, that people would make their way into the house of the Lord. How good and pleasant it is when, when, uh, when I said, let us go to the house of the Lord. It was good when I said, let us go to the house of the Lord, uh, David said. Uh, so, let us get the, get that uh, rhythm back in our in our in our spirit in our community. Oh God, um, let the churches fill up, Lord. Let the finances fill up as well, because everything's affected. Let the support be there for our missionaries, uh, for our various ministries that we support, for some churches for simply paying the bills of, of paying for heat and lights and uh, insurance for the building. We just pray, Lord, that you would provide and, and that your people would gravitate into the houses of the Lord that you have established in our communities. And Lord, 
Also, let, let this be an uh, evangelistic prayer that, that we would see new people, more new people, walk into our church. Uh, they see the sign. They sense your spirit calling them in. And let them find a church home where you want. But we, we, we ask you, Lord, our, our church is available. Our building is available. Uh, let people see that sign right now out in front that says, Hi, neighbor, you are invited. Let people just make their way into the house of the Lord. And uh, Lord, let revival break out in the midst of this pandemic. We pray, Lord, for Jerry and Jeannie Ellis as well as we're talking about the pandemic. Heal them of COVID in Jesus' name. Strengthen and encourage them tonight, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. Uh, so uh, thank you, Lord. Uh, we, we pray your blessing over our study in your word now. May your Holy Spirit teach us and guide us and give us what we need tonight. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen and amen. All righty. Well, I see someone by the name of Sydney. So God bless you, Sydney Jr. Good to have you with us tonight. 22 people on here. Uh, come on, everyone, share this, uh, this live stream on your post if you haven't. And... Uh, and uh, let's trust the Lord that we're going to get up to 30 tonight before this is over. All right. Well, anyway, we're going to start with Daniel chapter 1 tonight. So take your Bible or your Bible app. And um, we, uh, we started last week. I just wanted to mention, as we ended our study of Romans uh, chapter 16, uh, Romans 16, 25 and 26, uh, Paul concludes the epistle to the Romans by saying, now to him who was able to establish you, right, uh, be glory through Jesus Christ, but to him who was able to establish you by my gospel, Paul says, and by the preaching of Jesus Christ. So that's one way he establishes us, by the gospel, uh, by the revelation of, uh of the, of, the, of the hidden truth, which is now made manifest that Jesus has come to save Jew and Gentile. He's come for the whole world, not just the Jew. And by the prophetic scriptures. And so to him who is able to establish you by the gospel, by the revelation made manifest, and by the pro prophetic scriptures, to him be glory through Jesus Christ. So when we read that, he's able to establish us by the prophetic scriptures. So we're going into one of the main prophetic books of the Bible, the book of Daniel. I did say Daniel. And so we'll be in Daniel for many weeks. Uh, there's what, 12 chapters in Daniel, is that right? Yeah, 12 chapters. And uh, so we're going to go verse by verse. And uh, as you know, it does take some time. Uh, just as a reminder... In the Old Testament, there are the historical books, which are from Genesis to Esther. There are the poetic books, which are from the book of Job to the Song of Solomon, including, of course, Psalms and Proverbs. And then there's the prophetic books, which begin with Isaiah and through the rest of the Old Testament, all the way to Malachi. Those are the prophetic books. And Daniel is one of the latter prophetic books. Uh, he's one of the last uh, prophets. I think there's three, af two or three after him. And uh, this was written, well, if you look at verse number one, uh, the story begins in the third year of, of the, the reign of King Jehoiakim. And uh, if you study uh, Jewish history and the history of the kings and so forth, you would learn that he was the king the third year of, the, of that king was 604 B.C. So uh, Daniel wrote over the entire period of the 70 years that Israel was in captivity. Uh, this is unique about Daniel's uh, book, by the way. Uh, he was there the whole time writing, and, and his, his book uh, traces the whole 70 years of the, of the Babylonian captivity when Israel was taken captive by Babylon and removed from Israel, taken to Babylon for 70 years. So Daniel chronicles the whole thing in the, in the book of Daniel. So if you, if you take 604 as uh, the beginning date, now when you, when you work in Old Testament, you have to kind of uh, subtract from that to, 
to add to it, you have to subtract to it. So 604 plus 70 years would bring us up to, I think, 532 BC. Uh, so that's the time frame that we're talking about. Anyway, we're talking like, you know, five or 600 years before the birth of Jesus. And there's some very specific prophecies about the Messiah in this book, which really, um, someone I heard on the radio recently that had said that I think he said something like 80%. Is that right? 80%? No, no. Uh, maybe it was more like 28%. Yeah, 20, like a third. Uh, of the of the Bible is prophetic. Uh, maybe someone could look that up. I don't I don't know what how much what percent a very high percentage of the book of uh, of the of the Bible is prophetic, uh, meaning that um, it's a supernatural book, and a lot of it has been fulfilled in the first coming of Jesus, but a lot of it is yet to be fulfilled through the second uh, coming of Jesus. All right, twenty three people. All right, very good. Let's go for thirty. <laughs> If we can, I don't know what we could do about it other than pray for it, but, uh, hey, Katie Sm Smigleski, good to see you, Katie. God bless you. Hope you're doing well uh, in your, your line of work up there in uh, where Derry, I think it is, with the police force. God bless you. All right. Um, so the purpose of Daniel, if you remember, is to, is to, Remind Israel and remind the world, actually, that in spite of the judgment and the punishment that God is giving to Israel at this time, I mean, they're, they're, they're uprooted from their, uh, from their home in, in, uh, in Jerusalem, and they're stolen away, and, and, and Israel, uh, Jerusalem is destroyed. And in spite of all of that, uh, the, Daniel is writing the book to remind everyone that God still has a plan. That in spite of the discipline, in spite of what was going on, Messiah is still going to come. God still has a plan. And um, the new plan will, will be comprised of the law of Christ versus the law of Moses. The law of Moses being written in stone, but the law of Christ being written on the hearts of people. And uh, so we'll get into that as we go along. So anyway, let's look at verse number one. Verse number one has a lot of information in it. Uh, it says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it, or destroyed it, or apprehended it, or kicked everybody out and, and, you know, tore down all the buildings. Everything was wiped out and destroyed. And so the judgment of Israel had begun. And, and uh, the thing is, th this judgment that came upon Israel was, was prophesied a long time ago. And the Lord always forewarned the, His people, repent, don't, don't do that. If you do that, repent, turn from your idols, turn from your rebellion, and the people were very hard-headed, stiff-necked, uh, rebellious, and uh, they didn't—they didn't obey the Lord. Let me go back to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy uh, chapter twenty-eight. You could turn with me if you want. If not, I'll just read it to you. But uh, I think I read it last week. But Deuteronomy twenty-eight, verse fifty-eight. This is way back. You know, this is like. This is, this is in the first five books, the Pentateuch. <clears throat> this is written by Moses, but this is what the Lord said. If you do not carefully observe all the words of this law, remember Moses was given the law on, the, on Mount Sinai, um, that are written down in this book, that you may fear this glorious and awesome name, the Lord your God, then the Lord will bring upon you and your descendants extraordinary plagues, great and prolonged plagues, and serious and prolonged sicknesses. Moreover, he will bring back on you all the diseases of Egypt. Remember the ten plagues? Of which you were afraid, and they shall cling to you. Also, every sickness, every plague, which is not written in the book of the law, uh, will the Lord bring upon you until you are destroyed. You shall be left few in number. Whereas you were as the stars of the heavens in multitude, because 
you would not obey the voice of the Lord your God. And it shall be that just as the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good and multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and bring you to nothing, and you shall be plucked from off the land which you go to possess. And now what happened? Then the Lord will scatter you among the, the peoples from one end of the earth to the other. There will be there you, you will serve other gods which neither you nor your fathers have known wood and stone. So, uh, and there's many other prophecies pertaining to this. But anyway, in uh, Daniel chapter 1, verse 1, the judgment and, and, and the discipline began on Israel. Um, this is where if you were to read Ezra and Nehemiah, for instance, they talk about the rebuilding of the wall and the rebuilding of Jerusalem after these 70 years. So this brings up a, a point, actually. Um, so God's people, in the midst of the discipline, God is sending a prophet, uh, and, and uh, Jeremiah is a, a contemporary of Daniel. So there were two prophets. There were, there were, I think there were others as well at this time. To say that in spite of the disciplining of, of the Lord, in spite of calamity and hardship that the Lord allowed, God still speaks and God still loves his people. Fast forward to 2021, when we read the scriptures uh, from the New Testament. And in Hebrews chapter 12, it says that he whom the Lord loves he chastens. Do not despise the, the chastening of the Lord. For like a, a father that has a son, will he not chasten and discipline his son, uh, who, who is a legitimate son? So in other words, his love, his, his, um, his plans for a bigger picture for his people allow him uh, the privilege, if you will, to discipline his people, to keep them in line, or to get them in line and keep them in line. Can anyone relate? Um, it's an Old Testament happening, but it happens, in the new, it happens in our lives now. If we're not obeying the Lord, if we're not you know, running after God, obeying the, the Word of God, things could very well happen. God would allow things to happen. Uh, some of it's... Uh, uh, just a natural consequence of disobedience. But some of it is God's way of saying, hey, my son, let me, let me pull you back over here, you know? You know, you went over here, let me pull you back in line and get you lined up again. You, and and uh, sometimes, um, Hebrews 12, you, you check it out, Hebrews 12, 5 to 11, won't go there now. But whom he loves, he does discipline. And so this was, now this is for everybody, but then it was for the people of Israel. And he certainly, certainly disciplined them for 70 years. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so anyway, the, uh, the capture of the people, the, the besieging of Jerusalem began. Uh, king Je Jehoiakim is king of Judah. Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon. And by the way, Babylon, in case you didn't know, is the, is the present-day Iraq. Does it ring a bell with Saddam Hussein and Baghdad and all the stuff that's over there? But the Middle East, okay, so Israel, of course, is Middle East. But Iraq is, uh, how far is Iraq from Israel? Maybe 500 miles or so? Uh, so not that far, but in those days, it was really far. And uh, also, when you think of the story of Christmas, I said this before, when the Magi were studying the stars, they, they remembered the words of Daniel, because this is where Daniel was, and the Magi were there as well. And, and from, from the book of Daniel in you know, 600 B.C. until the time of Jesus, so 600 years later, they're still studying the writings of Daniel and uh, Jeremiah, and they knew to come to Jerusalem and then Bethlehem to see the Christ child. Pretty amazing st stuff right there. So anyway, this is how the Lord orchestrates things. He, he is the God of history, absolutely. So, verse number two, and the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God, 
and he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. So he's in Babylon. I'm not sure where the land of Shinar was, but uh, Babylon was a uh, b pretty big area at the time, much bigger than Israel. But it's interesting that he stole away the king, and he stole away the articles of the house of God, some of the things in the temple, you know, which was interesting. He wanted those things. And this reminds me, I, I have a little note here of John 10.10, 10, that the thief comes to kill, rob, and destroy. And it would be just like the enemy of our, of our heart, to, to plunder the people of God and take what we have. Like, for instance, uh, you know, as a musician, right? Uh, I used to play music and I, not as a Christian person, just as a person. And it wouldn't be glorifying God, but it was just music. But now, now that I'm saved and, and the, the music I play is sanctified, but it would be just like the enemy to take someone who's sanctified and take sanctified music and, uh, you know, ability and, and steal that away and use that talent now for his purposes. So if someone, and, and we've heard of this actually from uh, someone from Hillsong, I think it was, or uh, I forget, some other major uh, music ministry. All of a sudden, and they wrote some beautiful songs, some of which we sing. All of a sudden he had this, thing in his head that he doesn't believe in God anymore. Well, my goodness, how do you not believe in God anymore? But that's what he said. So now his talent in, in writing Christian music is being used for whatever. It's not being used to glorify God. But this is what verse number two is saying. This king Nebuchadnezzar took the good things that were used for God. He's taken them to his place to worship his God. And that's, that's like a, that's like a, a blasphemy almost. It's like, um, you know, it's like a very difficult thing to, to realize, but that's what Satan's up to when these things happen. Of course, in this case, uh, God allowed that to happen. I guess you could say the good thing about this case is uh, the things were being used, but the people were, were staying steadfast to the Lord, or, or at least they were beginning to get steadfast with the Lord. Yeah, lies of the enemy. That's right. That's right. So, uh, let me, am I missing anybody here? Did I play rock music and have long hair? Yeah. Yep. Way back in the day. Uh, okay, so let's go to 2 Kings chapter 23 for just a minute. 2 Kings 23. Second Kings 23, verse 35. So, so first and second Kings, I think Chronicles also, first and second Chronicles. Hello, Nancy. Hi, Nancy. How are you? <laughs> um, so the Chronicles and Kings write parallel you know, passages about what's happening in, in, the, in the prophets, in the prophetic books. Uh, so, so this is under the history books, but it's all the history of what the prophets were talking about. Anyway, 2 Kings 23, 35 says, Jehoiakim gave the silver and gold to Pharaoh, but he taxed the land to give money according to the command of Pharaoh, he, ex he exacted the silver and gold from the people of the land, from everyone according to his um, assessment, to give to Pharaoh. Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he became king. He reigned 11 years. His mother's name was Zedu uh, Zed Zebuda, the daughter of Padiah. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his fathers had done. So this is telling us that this... King Jedek, Jehoiakim, sorry, Jehoiakim was, uh, was a corrupt king. Then it goes on in verse chapter 24, verse 1 of 2 Kings. In his days, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up, and Jehoiakim became his vassal, his servant, for three years. Isn't it sad to think uh, 2 Kings 
23, 35, and now 2 Kings 24. Uh, the man of God became a servant of the evil king. That's a bad situation. But he turned and rebelled against him. And the Lord sent against him raiding bands of Chaldeans, bands of Syrians, bands of Moabites, bands of the people of Ammon. He sent them against Judah to destroy it, according to the word of the Lord, which he had spoken by his servants, the prophets. Surely at the commandment of the Lord, this came upon Judah to remove them from his sight because of the sins of Manasseh, according to all that he had done, and also because of the innocent blood that he had shed. For he had filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, which the Lord would not pardon. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoiakim and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? So Jehoiakim rested with his fathers. Then Jehoiachin, his son, reigned in his place. And the king of Egypt did not come against this land, etc. Anyway, a little background there. Hey, Juanita, good to see you. God bless you. Uh, we are in Daniel chapter 1. Let's go back over to Daniel chapter 1. So anyway, so chapter 1, verse 1, Nebuchadnezzar comes to begin besieging Jerusalem, takes the king of Judah captive, takes the, takes the king, takes articles from the temple into his own temple uh, to use in his own, uh, the treasure house of his God, he says. So that, 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 that would be something to really talk about, how, how the enemy wants to use the things of God for his own glory. Church, don't let them do that. Don't let them use your stuff. Don't let them use your talents. Don't let them use your family. Uh, you know what I mean? Protect what, what is the Lord's. Protect and cherish and take care of it. Um, mostly, as Paul says, we have this gift of salvation in earthen vessels. Protect that gift of salvation in the name of Jesus. Um, you know, protect it. Uh, safeguard it, uh, put up param uh, parameters around that, that uh, you know you can't go across certain ways or do certain things. you got to protect what's in your heart, what God gave you. He gave you salvation. Anyway, verse number three. Then the king, that's Nebuchadnezzar, instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants, and some of the nobles. So now the plot thickens. King Nebuchadnezzar has a, a what do you want to call it? A, a, a group, I can't think of the, a different, a group of eunuchs. Eunuchs are men that have been castrated. And uh, they're castrated so that they're not able to have sexual relations, or marry, or have kids. Uh, they're, they're made into servants uh, because they can't do anything else, basically. Uh, so they become faithful, they become loyal to their king. And uh, it's just interesting, in Babylon, they had these eunuchs, and they had a, a master of the eunuchs. His name is Ash Ashpenaz, the master of the eunuchs. So King Nebuchadnezzar tells Ashpenaz, get some of the children from Israel that we just stole away, right? Some of the king's descendants. There's a prophecy in uh, 2 Kings, I believe, we read it last week, that it was prophesied that some of, the, some of the King Hezekiah's descendants would be captive. And here it is fulfilled. And some of the nobles, so some of the royal families uh, had their kids stolen away in Israel. Um, so the children, and isn't it something to think about? And, and we're going to get into this. But how the first thing the king of, of uh, Babylon does is focus on the, on the children. And now he brings them to his place. You know, he, he, he steals them away from Jerusalem and takes them to his place over in Babylon. And then in verse number four, it describes them a little bit more. Young men in whom there was no blemish, so young and handsome and strong, but good looking, gifted in all wisdom, okay, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, 
who had the ability to serve in the king's palace, his palace. So he wants to get these young people, basically he wants to rearrange their culture and make them serve in his palace and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans are a group of people from southern Babylon. So what he's saying is to the, to the master of his eunuchs, get the kids, get the young people, get, get the, uh, the, the ones who, from the, that are kings descended. Make sure they're royal. Make sure they're well-bred. Make sure they're well-educated. Make sure they're smart and healthy and handsome and good-looking and uh, smart and intelligent. And um, because I want to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. Oh, really? This guy, King Nebuchadnezzar, has totally has an agenda. And so then it says, the king appointed for them, in verse number five, a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the king's wine, which he drank. So now he's going to give wine to the children and the young, the young men, the teenagers and delicacies. And then the, verse number five, three years of training so that at the end of that time, they might serve before the king. Can we just talk about this for a minute? This king wants to change the whole nation of Israel. He wants to, he wants to demolish it. And he's going to do that by rearranging the thought processes of the children. It's been said, if you want to change a country, reach the children. That's why, on a positive note, many of our missionaries, many Assembly of God missionaries, will focus on kids' ministries in foreign countries because, you know, we realize as, if we train the kids and teach the children as they grow up, they'll be rooted and established in the things of God. And the children will become the teachers to the adults. Um, so anyway, but if you want to, if you want to do that, if you want to change the culture of a country, touch the children, which is, this is like a, a warning. I mean, I don't know how the fifties and sixties were for everybody or the eighties and nineties, but what I read is, I mean, in fact, uh, I wonder how many of you have a uh, have serious radio in your car. Uh, we had it uh, in our new car for a couple of months before it expired. The, the other person had it. I didn't renew it. But while we had it, there's a, there's a station on there, the Billy Graham channel. And we were, Pamela and I were listening to Billy Graham preach in the 1950s. And it was like he was preaching, you know, last week, for goodness sakes. It was, the, I never knew that in the, in the 50s and 60s. I never knew that personally. You know, my background was Catholic. I didn't know preaching. I didn't know the Word of God, you know, like that. I knew some stories from the Catholic Church, but... Hey, Paula, Panasoro, good to see you. God bless you. Happy birthday belated to Peter, by the way. Uh, we're in Daniel chapter 1. So, um, yeah, so, so in the 50s, in the 60s, in the 80s, in the 90s, when my kids were young... Uh, it seemed like in America, at least at that time, I may be wrong, but it seemed like Sunday school was thriving. It was thriving where I was. Uh, Royal Rangers, Missionettes, uh, Vacation Bible School, <clears throat> summer camps, Christian summer camps. All that stuff was going on. Uh, the effort was going on to reach the children. And uh, now... I, I don't know about that. Um, I don't know about that. I see what's happening in public schools today. Uh, actually, not only today. I mean, this started in 1962 when prayer was taken out of public school. But in public school, there is another orientation going on. It's called humanism. It's called new age. It's called the new morality, where basically anything goes, my goodness, and if parents, uh, you know, get upset, they're severely criticized for having a, a, a biblical worldview. Um, but this is what Nebuch King Nebuchadnezzar was doing back then. And this is what's happening today, that uh, there's an effort to, to, to steal, 
you know, the biblical values that we have in our country by, by training the children in a different way. And, uh, you know, it's already happened, by the way. I mean, a lot of people nowadays in their 20s, they don't even know the gospel. A lot of them don't even know the, the gospel. Um, a lot of, I've met people who don't even know the, what Christmas is all about. They really don't, or, or Easter. They don't understand what it really is. They know it's a holiday, but they don't know what it really is. Uh, so there, there is that going on. But uh, I, I like what our brother Jerry said. Uh, we can turn this around. Uh, but, but you see what I'm saying. Here, here's King Nebuchadnezzar. He wants to give them the king's death. What, what, a, what an evil... Uh, deceptive person. They're, they're young. They're, they're stolen away from home, taken from their families. All right, they're sad. They're worried. They're upset. He's going to give them all the best food. He's going to give them wine to drink, like the kids really need wine. He's going to give them literature, new literature, new, a new language even. Verse number, uh, let's see, verse number... Seven, they even, he, he even gave them new names. So he, you know, he, wants to, he wants to take away their culture and their belief system because he wants to raise up an ungodly, an ungodly generation. And uh, I just want to say something here. The importance of teaching godly biblical values and, and virtues to our children is so, so important. Um, I mean, I'm a parent, I'm a grandparent, uh, and, and their identity, absolutely, he wanted to steal their identity. And I'm afraid that's what public schools are doing. They're stealing our kids' identity, if they have an identity. The thing is, a lot of, our, a lot of people in America uh, don't even care what's going on in the public school. I mean, some do, we hear about it, but a lot of people don't. But let me, let me read a couple of things here. And I, I want to get to this because some of us on here tonight um, ha have children or grandkids, and maybe they're not serving the Lord. Maybe they were young. When they were young, they heard the word. They went to church with us, etc. But they grew up and they walked away. But let me tell you something. It's not over yet. Uh, if they have a deposit of the word of God in their heart, we need to pray that, that that seed will come alive in their heart. That's why we're praying for the salvations of our loved ones. Many of our kids and grandkids know the Bible. They know the truth. They're just not living the truth, but we, we still need to pray for them. Others, uh, others of our children may have been around us before we were really saved, and we never trained them properly, or they, they maybe they got a mixed message, but it's still not too late for them. But let me go back here to Deuteronomy chapter 11. Deuteronomy 11, verse 18. I think you all know this. This is, this is um, part of the law that was given to Moses. Uh, you shall lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul and bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You know what frontlets are? It's like a little, uh, a little container like this, like the Jewish people would tie them into their hair, I think. They would hang down. And in there would be a little scroll of the Word of God. So they, they literally did that. Um, you shall teach them to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. And you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates, and uh, that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers to give them like the days of the heavens above the earth uh, and so on and so forth. So that's Deuteronomy 11. Uh, let's see, Proverbs 22, uh, which I want to talk about for just a second. Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way they should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Um, we... Uh, We've seen kids that were taught the Word of God. When they have to be, you know, in their 20s, they walk away from the truth. 
And then it says, when they're old, you know, uh, when they're old, they, uh, he will not depart from, from it. But there's a, there's, a, <laughs> there's a span of time between, between the departure and the return. And we don't know what that is. It might be two years, five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30, whatever. But the promise is when they're old, right? When he's old, he will not depart from it. So you have to have faith and trust that if you did your, and no one's perfect, but if you did your best to teach your children the word of God and they walk away, well, you know what? No one could ever say you didn't try. You tried. But they walked away. Now, now it's their responsibility to make that decision. But the promise is when they're old, they won't depart from it. So we need to pray that the, the term old won't be too old. You know what I mean? It'll be in our lifetime. It'll be soon. It'll be, you know, because the longer you wait, I think the harder it is. Although maybe not. Maybe the, maybe the, longer, it, the longer it takes, it, it takes that long for someone to realize. That, you know, that could be. But uh, let's just trust the Lord that, that if we do our job, you know, and remember, the Lord loves our children more than we love our children. I know that's hard to realize, but he wants them to be saved more than we want them to be saved. It's his desire that everyone would be saved. So he's there, and the word of God is implanted within them, and we need to just pray that God would water those seeds of faith and they, they would return. And if, if our kids never heard the gospel, and there's some situations where kids grew up in an ungodly home and we got saved later, well, we need to still pray for our kids to, that they would come to the truth. Okay, Matthew 19, uh, verses 13 to 15. Little children were brought to Jesus that he might put his hands on them and pray, but his disciples rebuked them. And Jesus said, let the little children come to me. Do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And then he laid his hands on them, and he departed from there. Jesus loves children. And uh, what a shame it is when children are not taught the things of God. Uh, and th these are, there's great implications here. Uh, and praise the Lord, we have our kids' ministries going on. We have two classes now, 2 to 5 and 6 to 12 at the 1045 service. Bring your kids to church. Bring your grandkids to church. We understand, as the leaders of the church, we understand the importance and the value of teaching the children. They're not just playing games. I mean, it is fun, but they're not just playing games. There's, there's always a, 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 a reason and a rhyme to the lessons. And they're learning the Word of God in kids. And thank you, Pamela, for your oversight of that very, very important ministry. Uh, bring your kids to church. Bring your grandkids to church. Bring your neighbor's kids to church. Bring your nieces and nephews to church. Bring them into the house of the Lord. There's something so unique about that whole experience of getting up in the morning, having breakfast together getting dressed and ready to go out of the house, to go to the house of the Lord. There's something so special about that routine that Satan has tried so hard to steal from our culture. And we need to get it back. I'm telling you, church, we need to get that back. And so our church, I don't know about other churches, we have a kid's ministry. And uh, Pamela is working with the teachers every week, getting it in order. And we, we have plans for the children. We have we have, uh, what do you call it, a, 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 a study plan for the kids to learn the Word of God in an age-appropriate way. And uh, so, yeah, bring your kids. It's important to bring your kids or your grandkids into the house of the Lord. All right. Uh, Colossians chapter 3. Let me read a couple of things more here. Uh Colossians 3 and verse 21, it says this, uh, Children, obey your parents. This is well pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Just a little admonition to the fathers out there to love your kids. Don't push their buttons. Uh, work with them. Help them. Uh, in Ephesians 6, 4, it says, uh, Fathers, don't, don't provoke your children to wrath. Bring them up 
in the training and admonition of the Lord. So train up your kids in a godly manner. But anyway, back in Daniel, we, we see the exact opposite. But on the other hand, on the other hand, what, what's happening? Okay, Daniel 1, verse 6. Uh, among those of the sons of Judah uh, that were stolen away, that were young men at this point, Daniel, Hananiah, Meshael, and Azariah. Right four, Now, four people are mentioned. There's probably tons more. If you go back to verses 3 and 4, uh, young men, no blemish, good-looking, wise, knowledgeable, quick to understand, ability to serve in the king's palace. Like These were all candidates to be the the, the ungodly king's uh, cabinet, if you will. He, he, was, he was really getting ready to radically change Israel by making those Israel kids his, his people. Um, and he, verse number seven, I'll get that in a minute, but he changed their name. But verse number eight, but Daniel, it says, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. So what I want to say is, thank the Lord for godly parents in Israel at that time that taught their children the Word of God. Now, the Word of God for them was the Pentateuch and uh, whatever, whatever word of the prophet that they had at that time. But Daniel knew the Word of God. Thank God that he knew the Word of God. If he didn't have a, a foundation, if he wasn't grounded in the Word, he would be totally dead meat with King Nebuchadnezzar. But he purposed in his heart, I'm not going there to eat that food or drink his wine. Now, now he didn't say anything about learning the language or the literature. He probably did. He was a very smart person. But he was not going to corrupt his spirit person by defiling himself and go against what he knew from the Word of God. That's a lesson so, so important. So that, that started way before he, he uh, got captive, uh, captive, captive captured by King Nebuchadnezzar. That started when he was, in, when he was a little baby uh, growing up uh, in Israel. So thank the Lord there were people in Israel at, at the time, in spite of the king being corrupt, that were teaching their kids you know, godly things, and, and Daniel is proof of that. Anyway, so there was Daniel, Hananiah, Meshael, and Azariah, verse number 6 and verse number 7. To them the chief of the eunuchs, gave them names. This is what I mean. He's changing their name. He's changing their language. He's changing their literature. He's changing their food. They're changing, he's changing their culture. Their surroundings are changed because they're in a different place. They're, he's changing their identity. And so their names were, Daniel became Belshazzar, and the other three became Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You ever hear of them? In the fiery furnace, right? Uh, yeah. And so anyway, so we'll get into that next time. But, but Daniel purposed in his, verse number eight, purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. And so the story goes on. I just looked at the clock. It's eight o'clock. Um, I have to stop here. But... Uh, you can see the parallels of what's happening in our culture and what happened in that culture. You could say, uh, I don't mean to be on my high horse about the public school system, but it, you, you can't help but recognize it. It's like the public school system and our culture is like King Nebuchadnezzar trying to steal our children from their roots in Christianity, Judeo-Christian ethic, and, and teach them a different way of life where morals don't matter, uh, partners don't matter, language doesn't matter, uh, you know, um, everything is new age and humanism. Halloween is like a tremendous deal in public school, uh, celebrating the witches and this and that, and oh my goodness, it's crazy. But you can see the parallel, it is happening. Uh, when our kids were young, we, we removed them from public school uh, dur during Halloween. It was just, back then it was bad. Now it's even worse. Um, so anyway, uh, that's when Pamela began the homeschool, by the way. So anyway, so we're going to have to stop at verse number, at the end of verse number seven. We'll start at verse number eight next time. Um, so anyway, I think this is a good study. I think we're off to a good start. 
uh, in the midst of all of this. Uh, amen to that, Pamela. You're right. And, and you know what? I preached on that a couple of years ago. And I preached a whole message on, on the, the problem with Halloween. And uh, some people didn't like it and didn't agree with me. And I, I don't know what to say about it. I have to stand true to my convictions. It is the word of God. It says, to, like, like my thing was, speaking of Halloween, which is coming up, why celebrate death and gruesomeness and ugliness and goblins and ghosts and evil spirits? Well, everything is contrary to the word of God. Everything about that is contrary. It's making fun of the afterlife. It's, be, it's being t entertained by the afterlife. When, when actually, if you think about it, all that stuff is true, except it's not fun. It's gruesome and ugly, and it's eternal damnation. It's crazy. Uh, so anyway, we may get into that more as we go along, since Halloween is coming. But anyway, all, all that to say, Daniel is written that in spite of all of that. Now just think about if you were the parents of of Daniel and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah, if you were their parents. And it, uh, Jerusalem's destroyed, wiped out, burned down. Everyone's taken captive. They're all brought into Babylon. For 70 years, they're captive in Babylon under this King Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, just think how the, the, the parents and the people are grieving when they realize God wasn't fooling around when he said he was going to take care of us if we didn't repent and get right, <laughs> which is a whole other thing. If we're, sensing, if we're sensing the COVID problem and we're sensing the pandemic and all the ramification, ramifications of what's going on, we go back to 2 Chronicles 7, uh, when if my people who are called by my name, etc., but the calamities were caused by the Lord in the first place. They weren't caused by the enemy. God brought the calamities upon Israel at that time. But if the people would repent, that, you know, he would relent and heal their land. In a similar way, are we hearing the Lord say, all right, I'm letting all this happen, not only in America, but through the whole world, because uh, I want you to come to a place to repent and get it right and, and get on with your your faith in me and your Christian life. I think that's what the Lord's doing through all of this. And uh, it, it's really not a whole lot better. I mean, it's better in the sense that we could gather at church. But, you know, the vaccination is still an issue. And, and, and now there's some mandates with the vaccination. And um, some people are for it. Some are against it. It's just like a political thing again, like in November. I'm just saying, isn't the Lord using all of this no matter what you choose to do, it doesn't really matter. But what you choose to do, is in, in, in the midst of all of this, isn't the Lord trying to get his church back on track again? And I think that's the bottom line. That's what happened to Israel. God was getting them back on track again. And through the, the, uh, the prophetic voice of Daniel and Jeremiah, he was reminding them that although I'm disciplining you, I'm still speaking to you. So we could say, although the Lord may be disciplining us now through this pandemic, he's still speaking to us through the word of God. And I'm going to close on that note. Amen. So we'll start next time at verse number eight. I'm going to make a note right here. And uh, let me pray. Dear Lord God, thank you for this time. Thank you for this study. Thank you for the book of Daniel. Thank you for all the people that were on here. I don't know how many were on, but thank you for every one of them. Um, let us uh, digest what we just heard from your word. Let us apply it to our lives, to our families, to our children and grandchildren. And Lord God, may our kids' ministry at the church totally flourish at this point. Let it flourish. Let young families come in that, that know this, that they, they want their kids to learn the word of God. Let them come into church where, where the kids could learn at, at their age-appropriate level. But Lord, let this explode at new life. And uh, let some public school families come into the house of the Lord to, to counteract what the kids are learning in public school. So anyway, Lord, thank you for this. Uh, bless our time in, in the book of Daniel as we go forward. Let us have a good night, a good rest of the week. Bless, O oh God, the yard sale on Saturday. Let it bring in a lot of money to bless our missions department. 
Let helpers come forward to help out with the tables and setting up. Let it be a great time of fellowship and a great witness to the community. So, and Lord, bless our Sunday morning at church. Uh, let it be an awesome, awesome time in your presence. So we thank you. We praise you. We give you all glory and, and thanks. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. And everybody said amen and amen and amen. Uh, I'm going to respond to some of these requests right now. So God bless you. I love you. I'll see you soon. Bye.